What's going on, fam? Alex Shlinsky here for the Anti-Hustler Weekly Show. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Today, we're going to be talking about how to get ahead of 99.9% of your competition, five levers to pull or five considerations to take before we move into 2024 so you can have the best year of your life, starting off, of course, with an incredible January in Q1. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Brian Downard. How are you doing, buddy? Living the dream. Hey, oh, all right. We have a great show for you today. If you are here for the first time, please hit that like or love button. If you are watching us on Facebook, come join us on Zoom. You're always welcome to join us. We do the show every single week on Thursdays at 3.15 p.m. Eastern, live in our Facebook group, and you can find the replays at our Replay Vault on prospectingondemand.com. We are here for you to share the most value we possibly can. So today we're going to be talking about the five levers that you need to scale. This is an extremely important topic because ultimately there's so many things going on in our business at all times that it's really hard to just identify, like, how do we simplify things, right? Everyone wants to simplify things, and yet we love complicating things. And so what we wanted to do is break down today just some very simple considerations to help you ultimately get ahead of your competition and really just dominate the coming year. And that's what we're all about. That's what we're here to help you do, dominate the upcoming year. So if you're excited and ready to rock and roll, if you're watching a replay or live, drop a seven in the chat. Let's do this thing. Let's make it happen. Before we do, Brian, why is it important to even consider getting ahead of the competition? What does that even mean? Yeah, I think it's, using to me personally getting ahead is and not personal for me personally i know we speak a lot about this where we don't necessarily want to focus on what everyone else is doing but in terms of like competitiveness of just the market in general right i'm not talking about like the guy who's selling the same thing as you but like how do we set ourselves up for success so that in a crowded market space because let's be frank as more people come into this space it's a little bit harder to be seen and heard there's this hermosi effect we talk about to stand out how can I seed plant in a time where people um, are probably taking the foot off the gas? How do I seed plant and set myself up to be in the best position to succeed in the new year? And mm -hmm. I'm excited for this show today because we've talked about a lot of these over the past couple of weeks, like in specific detail. But I think today is a really good encapsulation of all the things you can be considering and doing. Um, so, yeah, you can just be in whatever position uh, or put yourself in the best position to get whatever win you've identified as your thing. Because, again, this is the anti-hustler show. It's not just working senselessly for no purpose. What is your purpose? Define it. Use the downtime to set yourself up to get there. And all the things we have today are going to get you guys started with that. Absolutely. So one of the recent shows that we did was the end of year sales blitz, right? The concept yes. of that was to, hey, make a bunch of money before the end of the year, mediate action taking, implementation. And today we're going to juxtapose that with like a deeper thought mastermind, a deeper thought approach to scaling in 2024. Too often we don't take the actual time to really like plan and consider. We're just letting the you know winds of our business or the current of our business take us. And we're just kind of doing a bunch of things. What we want to do is just slow down for a second. And we're going to touch on two really important things before we dive into the five considerations. And that is the first consideration of where are we going? So here's the concept, right? Think about it right now. Who wins in a race? A marathon runner or an 100 yard dash runner? Who wins in a race? Well, the answer inherently, of course, is going to be, it depends on the race. Now, when you join our mastermind, Prospecting On Demand, right? So we have a mastermind group for agency owners and entrepreneurs to help them scale. We ask two main questions. What will make your time in POD successful? We consider this your order, right? So if you go to a restaurant and you order a pizza and they bring you the best chicken wings you've ever had, even if you love the chicken wings, you're still gonna want what? That pizza, because that was what the order was. And then we ask, what's the main goal? Now, the reason we ask what the main goal is, is we want to understand what it needs to happen in POD to be successful. And we also want to understand what we're uh, uh, trying to achieve in general, this Wizard of Oz goal. What's Oz so we can build the yellow brick road to it? And sometimes they're the same, meaning we can achieve this goal in a six-month period. And sometimes it is not feasible because it's a five-year goal. But the thing that's important to remember as you move into the new year is success itself is not a goal. Freedom is not a goal. We need something that is tangible, something that is beyond reproach. If your kid asks you for Christmas or Hanukkah and they say, I want a PlayStation 5, there's only one way that they have a PlayStation 5, and that is in their hands. It cannot be esoteric. It cannot be some ethereal idea of I'm going to get you a gaming system. <laughs> it's either they have it or they don't. And so when we come into our business, especially moving into 2024, and we say we want to be successful or we want to have freedom or we want to win our race. What is the race? What are the defined parameters? Without that, we can never be successful. And if you struggle with this, 
I never get to really say this, but you should definitely get a copy of this book, The anti Sir Handbook. A really smart Jewish man uh, wrote this who's balding. That's me, by the way, just in case you didn't know that. I'm that guy uh, who wrote this book. The concept here is other better, other better clearly. qualities than your, your hair loss. <laughs> I just have to keep bringing it up every show just so that it's, it's you know, conscious. <laughs> you don't forget. I'll never forget. Just making sure. Where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish, right? What is our goal? The more work you put into that, the more clear you are, the more success you will have. So I wanted to start with that, Brian. If you want to kick off anything else there, that's fine. The next piece I want to talk about will be simplicity and complexity, but I wanted to let you start from there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I would also say that if you are in a position where you are more in hunting mode and you need to make money, it's not about like achieving these lofty goals you may have and you just need to pay the bills. Like that's okay. You can be in a season of hunting and making and grinding it out. I know we talk about the anti-hustle mindset, like work hard, not smart. I'm sorry, ver vice versa, smart, not hard. But in some cases, it does need to be flipped up. You do need to work um, hard and not necessarily just smart. You need to go do shit and see what sticks. So we're going to give you guys some tangible ways to go take action on that. But I do know people who show up to this call, some people are getting the business going. They're wanting to get started. So um, you have to grind at the, at the initial stage. We're going to give you some examples of how you can do that. Yep. The next piece is just complexity kills, right? So we spoke about this, the emails this week kind of leading up to this show was about the concept of how complexity kills and simplicity wins. The reality is there's just thousands of levers to pull, right? There's just so many different ideas, implementation, shiny objects, keys to success. The reality is, right, we understand at Prospecting On Demand for Brian and Alex, right? We're just like one amidst hundreds of thousands of people that share content online of how to grow, right? We're just one of them, right? And on one platform, right? There, there's literally numerous platforms, uh, both physical and digital to get this material and insight. How do you siphon through all of that? And the reality is just complexity kills. The simplest way we can actually grow is by simplifying things to a few levers. Now we've done this training before on the assembly line agency, as we've called it before, but just an easy way to compartmentalize how you can start building. Think about it in three conceptual ways. How am I going to generate leads, which is prospecting? How am I going to sell those clients, which is sales? And how am I going to retain those clients, which is fulfillment? If you simplify your business into those three concepts, it will make your process of deep work a lot easier. That doesn't mean the nuance of like hiring and productivity and organization and operations and all those things aren't important. All of them are. But if we just simplify the business into a thousand levers into three, it will make it easier to be successful. And the two considerations you want to have for that are two philosophical principles. One is Occam's razor. Okay. Occam's razor is just one of the most valuable considerations for decision making and problem solving. Occam's razor says that when you're presented with multitude of options to solve a problem or to identify what said problem was, the simplest answer is always the right answer. I like giving an absolutely outrageous example of Occam's razor because I think it's funny to kind of consider this. It's usually not this simple, but ultimately it's valuable to think. If I go in the morning and I go to my uh, kitchen and on the kitchen counter is a half eaten bagel with the knife still in the cream cheese, there's two options of how this could have happened. One, my wife woke up in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the evening, excuse me, and had half a bagel and forgot to put it away. Or two, someone broke into my house, ate a bagel and left half of it. Which one is the answer? Well, Occam's razor would of course tell us that the likelihood is your wife did it, right? The reality comes down to if you are not thinking in Occam's razor principles, oftentimes, logically, you're probably thinking in a complexity mindset because there's a perceived value of complexity that the more complex something is, the better it must be, which we see this all the time with like workflows online and in the high level group where someone will post like this, <laughs> they'll post this insane like picture, Brian, of a workflow that has oh, yeah. 700 and, there, and there's a thousand comments on the post like, wow, I want this. You don't even know what it is, but just because it's complex. Yeah people want it. Right. And so that concept of Occam's razor is key. Go ahead, B. Yeah. It's, I was going to add a silly story about like how the irony of how I used to create infographics, which by nature, infographics simplify and distill a, to a topic into one long, typically visual. Um, but the amount of work and effort and complexity it took for me to build them was like this dichotomy and it was just wasting my time. And a lot of people do that in their business as well. They focus on like the dopamine hits of like making content or doing things maybe aren't going to move the needle as much. Um, and one of the, that was JC Height actually, who I saw a comment on a post Nathan Hirsch made about like, Hey, would, if you're a seven figure entrepreneur, what's your advice for getting to eight, right? Like that's kind of our, where we're trying to track right now. And JC Height commented, it was like, be boring. The more boring and simple and repeatable you can be, even though it doesn't sound fun and exciting, you will scale your business. You will make money. Um, 
so I think a lot of us have to have that healthy reminder that if we're trying to be too fancy, we're trying to do too much, we're not going to be able to scale. And like a really tangible example of that is selling too many services to too many different people. You will hit a ceiling. It's different for everyone uh, what that ceiling looks like, but you will hit that. So um, yeah, just wanted to start with that. The last thing in terms of a philosophical principle before we dive into the five considerations is 80-20, right? The 80-20 principle. Again, when we consider all the levers, and this is something that Brian and I talk about all the time, it's like, there's so many things that we can work on, right? In our business and personal life, right? There's so many things, right? Just alone right now for some clarity on POD side of things, right? We are prepping and uh, our event in February. We just launched our new members area. We are onboarding new clients. We are supporting current clients. We are transitioning coaches. We are um, working on a new product. We are working on sponsorship. I'm just naming things off. We just we just hired a CMO and operational consultant. Exactly. We're planning a marketing. We're doing plan. a lot. PR. We're doing a PR run for for the the book. Literally hundreds of levers, right? And one of the challenges is Brian and I want to have you know eight arms and unlimited time and no personal responsibilities so we can do all of it. But here's the thing: no one's capable of that. It's impossible. There's no possible way. And it's and the problem I think in the industry, and particularly for Brian and I as well, is like no one is everyone wants to be to peak performance. Like we are the most optimized and it's an unrealistic expectation because inherently since you can't pull all the levers all the time, because there's a thousand levers in front of you and you have two arms, right? Ultimately, you're going to think you're not at peak performance, right? So the best way to do it is yeah. through the Pareto principle. Like what 20% of the levers that I'm going to pull is going to get 80% of the impact. And so what we put together with the five considerations are this concept, but that only comes down yeah. to auditing, right? Like if you're not, evaluating how your year has gone and what you've done in each element of your business, you're not really going to make any progress because in general, you don't really know what's happening. You have like a basic sense of it. I, I've, I've made this joke before and I'll, I'll say it really quickly, but like when I hired a nutritionist earlier this year, they asked me like, oh, how often do you eat chocolate? Because like, I'm a kind of a chocolate fiend. And I'm like, oh, uh, probably like once a week. She's like, okay, cool. I want you to write down every single thing that you eat for the next seven days. I eat chocolate like five days a week. So I was like, oh, wow. So experience wasn't enough knowing like, oh, I know I eat chocolate, but how much I do it. Self-reporting surveys are really bad, right? People are really bad at self-reporting. Data doesn't lie. And so the more auditing you do, the better you will be. And that helps you identify what levers you need to be pulling. Yeah. And this deep work is really necessary. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think it'd be helpful if we jump um, in the, when, when we jump into these five to start with number two, because I think it kind of builds on what you were saying there, if that's cool. Well, you. I'll let you, I'll let you start with number two then. Love it. So you were talking about like looking at what you're doing and auditing like your time. There are obviously tasks inside of your business that are essential, even when you are keeping it simple. Um, and if you have access to any kind of team right now, it may look like just reshuffling the deck for you, right? Again, we want you guys to see behind the curtain of what we're doing in POD. We, over the course of scaling this business and 10Xing it over the past couple of years, uh, have all worn multiple hats at different points trying to keep everything together. And what we've realized is now with so many things going on, that's untenable. We can't maintain this to get to the next thing we want, right? And there's that classic saying, to get something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. And that's this growing phase all of us at different stages are going through. But what I'm expressing to you guys is really looking at your team? Are you investing in talent and team? Are you making the proper um, you know, investments of your time into your team or investments in money financially and resources to go source and place team members to buy back your time? I really, really want to. One of the biggest shifts that Brett Linnencall kind of instilled in me in his coaching with us was this idea of you need you guys, you, Brian and Alex specifically, look at your time as valued at $1,000 per hour. All of you here, same thing. If you were doing sub $1,000 sub $500 an hour tasks you need to strongly consider what it looks like to get someone else to do that for you, or at least know what it costs and bake it into your fulfillment costs. So the next client you sign, you can have that padding and in the margin to hire that person and get started with stop just doing everything yourself. So investing in team and talent, I think, and reshuffling the deck when you have team and talent sometimes to make sure that again, cliche, but that the right butts are in the right seats. It's key and makes all the difference for you to focus in on what you're best at. So um, I think it was a good place to start. And Alex, I had a couple more notes you wanted to probably share on that as well. No, I think you honestly nailed it. There's there's no reason to can, like expound upon something that, that was simple enough. And I think that's honestly the yeah. reality because the truth is joking aside, but also at the same time being self-deprecating, 
Of course I could share more on it, but the concept here, the entire purpose of this is simplicity scales. And so what Brian is talking about is absolutely critical. The second element that we want to touch on is client retention is as important as client acquisition. Okay. And the reality is, you know, this is just one of the big kind of things that we pound the table for in prospecting on demand consistently, like over and over and over. And I know people want to argue the concept, like you can't retain clients that you don't have. Yes. Obviously, we are aware of this. Like, okay, great. And now what? Right? It's not. It's not that. That's not what we're suggesting. If you're brand new and you have no clients, well, then yeah, obviously, client acquisition is going to take priority. But if you're an established business, meaning even a freelancer that's been doing this for three to five years, and basically you just cannot break past the like twenty-ish thousand mark, because we see people, we talk to them that have been in the industry for three, five, seven years that are, you know, their highest months have been 35, but they're always in a roller coaster. It's like, oh, it's 5,000 and then 7,500 and then 12,000 and then 15,000. And I got a big website deal and it was 20 grand. Then I'm back to seven. And it's like insane, right? And because the main focus for them consistently is I just got to get more clients, but they don't realize that they have a faucet that they're opening and turning on and the bucket has a hole in it. And you're like, why isn't this working? Why is the bucket not filling up? The reality is while acquiring clients obviously is crucial, right? Retaining clients is equally vital. Establishing strong and long-term relationship with clients really contributes to sustained growth for your business. And that's something that we've done incredibly well at POD. We have a huge base of legacy clients, people that have stayed with us for a year to two years or more in a coaching program, which is I, not- I see a good looking Canadian man on this phone who fits that mold right, right now. Over a year. These things are really important to be able to be successful long-term. Now, they don't do it because of charity. It's because of commitment to consistent value being provided. And that's the key. If you focus on this more in detail over the coming three months, you will actually end up making more money and also being up further ahead of the competition because the majority is of the people in the space, they focus on acquisition. And the reason why is just basic psychology. There's a stronger dopamine hit of a new sale, of a new experience, of a new opportunity than there is of servicing a current client. There's also a lot of material out there, right? Including us, by the way. So I don't want to say that, oh, we're the ones that don't do this. Of course we do this, right? Where the majority of the material that you see online is about new sales, more money, bigger business, bigger growth not retain longer, create a better experience. It's just not as common. That's the reality. So that would be number two. Brian, do you want to jump to number three? Cool. Uh, just, I'm going to stay here. And the theme of simplicity, sure. though, I'm going to run through it quickly. I want to give you guys some tangible examples you can implement for this, right? How do I right now and moving into the end of the year set up like myself to retain clients better? I think one the thing that's overlooked and will sound like maybe overly simple when I say it is the idea of gifting, right? Meaningful gifts. Ideally, one of our clients just at a spotlight session, Marilyn Jenkins on this, was really powerful, right? She has gifts for when they're onboarded, certain milestones in the relationships, birthdays, obviously now during the holidays. Um, try to make it thoughtful and it, it can go a long way to just building more than a transactional relationship. Um, I would say doing regular check-in calls with your clients that are scalable, um, where you maybe not having to do every single one all the time, but there's a balancing act here because Isaac Voss, who's on this call, does an amazing job of retaining their clients through this mechanism of really giving them that attention and time they deserve. Um, we're working with him to make that more scalable for sure. But this idea of don't hide from your clients and don't hide from the communication with your clients. If you're just hoping that credit card is going to hit every month and they're not going to pay attention to it, you're going to get a churn email sooner rather than later. So this idea of TLCs where you are going to call clients out of the blue who have been quiet to get back on their radar, to establish communication, make them understand and appreciate the value you're giving them. And then lastly, actually get results. You actually have to get results. If we're chasing vanity metrics like views and likes and not actual leads and money through the door, it's going to be an uphill battle. So just a couple of considerations on how you can move into the new year successfully. Love that. Great insight. Um, number three, let's talk about it. Number three is strategic partnership number three. and collaboration. Ooh, I like. Okay. Now, Brian and I did a session. Oh, no, the video died. That's so annoying. All right. I'm going to have to move it to this one. And that is going to ruin the recording for today. That's a bummer. That's such a bummer. It's all right. You still look, you still look all good. good. All good. Let's all go. Good. All right. So number three is strategic partnerships and collaborations. So Brian and I did a session uh, on this probably like four months ago or so, uh, maybe a little longer. 
Um, we got a really good updated version for you guys. We can do as an episode soon as well. I uh, interviewed seven agency owners that are doing over a quarter million dollars per month. Um, the reason being is that those are the one percent of the one percent, right? Like the majority of beginner agency owners, the concept of making twenty five grand per month is incredible, amazing. Try ten xing that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's 250k a month, a quarter million dollars a month. Uh, obviously, roughly just under a million dollars per quarter, right? Pretty amazing, right? So this consideration of strategic partnerships and collaborations, every single one of those seven had this. Whether they worked with the joint chiropractic and they had 80 of their locations, or they worked with Restore Hyper Wellness and had over 100 locations, or they worked with Gracie Baja Jiu Jitsu and had over 100 locations, or they worked with Burn Fitness and had over 50 locations. This model is incredibly valuable. The one to many approach is key. The ability to have an opportunity to grow with a franchise business is necessary. This includes going to events, sponsorships, et cetera. I'm gonna keep this really simple on what you need to do to make this happen. Part of your business outreach needs to be to franchise opportunities that give you a chance of a one to many over time. It's not usual that it's right away. This is a long-term play, kind of like an SEO thought process. Let's use the joint just as an example. The joint is a chiropractic franchise in the United States, if you're unaware. Pretty, pretty easy to understand based off this exact case study, okay? One of our clients in POD, okay, worked with a joint, ironically, in Tampa, okay? He got this client such great results that the person who owns it mentioned to him, hey, my regional manager noted to me, that I'm the number one location in the region. And he said he was interested in chatting with you. Pretty awesome. That regional manager, I believe, ran more than 15 the joint locations. Guess what happened? The one client became five clients. The five clients became all 15. And then guess what? There's more than one regional manager. That regional manager connects them to another regional manager. 15 becomes 30. 30 becomes 60. 60 becomes over I think it was over 80. I can't remember the exact number, but something of that nature. This is how you multiply your growth. And this was in a six month period for a pretty sure he was 20, 20 year old client. The opportunity is massive if you do this. A B process is super good. It works really well to do it this way of deliver for the for the company and then for the individual location and ask them for their regional manager so you can see if we can create more opportunity in a pilot program. We're working on this with several of our clients right now. It's something that we strongly, strongly recommend you take time on. This is really most effective by sponsoring events or going and attending events at the least, BNIs and walking in person, listen to the words, in person to the local businesses that are franchises so you can earn that business. That is number three. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say having a healthy balance of a inbound ad strategy and outbound prospecting, smooth out the humps on this. I think referral partners not only take time to develop and find, but they tend to be bigger windfalls in less frequent periods of time. So they may send you five in a month. The next month, it might not be as many. The next month, it's 20. And then it's like two the next month. So, um, or it takes a couple of months for them to even send you anyone, right? So I, what I hear a lot of times people say is like, oh, like I got this partnership, this relationship, this guy said they're going to send me all this business. And then that gives them the, the peace of mind to take the foot off the gas on all the other prospecting channels two or three months go by. And it's like, well, he didn't actually send me anything. And then they're screwed, right? So you need to have a healthy balance and don't just depend on this person to make it for you until they're actually reliable and making that happen. So food for thought. I totally agree, Alex. The one, you can wait your way into this and like maybe they come across from a client you acquire eventually and you get referred up the ladder, but to accelerate it, you've got to go attend sponsorship events. And a lot of times franchises will have events specifically for their franchisees. So there's opportunities to go. You just have to go find them and see what they are. And then I would also implore you to probably not do this until you actually can start to get really good results for your niche because that's going to be the prerequisite. If you are not getting good results, you will very quickly burn that bridge relationship. That's and right. now that referral partner is gone. So that's right. food Number for thought. Four, Want to take it? Well, let's go. Cool. Uh, yeah. So this one is around making data driven decisions. We at POD, I think, do a really good job of this with our clients in particular to help them make educated decisions. It's something that, again, as we've grown and are going through some growing pains, we need to take a hard look at, as I'm sure a lot of you do, 
how are we automating the reporting of the data so it's not all had to be acquired manually, right? And again, what are the, and it's, it's such a cliche saying again, your KPIs and the key phrase here is, uh, or key word is key, ironically, because uh, like Tyler Jorgensen, our new CMO is saying, if you just have like 20 to 30 metrics, 50 metrics you're looking at, it's probably not that important. My opinion as the owner of the company, probably only really a couple of things you really need to have a good sense of at any time in your business, which would be what kind of money are you making? So your revenue and your profit, what is your churn rate, AKA how many clients are you losing? Number of sales calls booked and the number of sales calls uh, closed. I know that's an overly simplification, a oversimplified version of this, but if you guys do not know these numbers, you don't know how many clients you're churning in a month. If you don't know, um, how many sales calls you're booking, or if you know that it's like not that many, okay, these are the things you need to start looking at to make informed decisions because you get, again, you get caught in this busy work. And if you know you need to book five, 10, 20 sales calls a week, and I promise you, like I want you to hear half listening. This is probably the most important thing I'll say here. If the only difference in your business was that you booked 20 to sales calls a week with your ideal clients and you went from like random referrals one or two a week here or there your life and business would completely change so if you are like playing with your website or playing with content or chasing down things that aren't moving the needle for that kpi how many sales calls do i book this week at least having that in front of your face will give you some level of motivation or accountability to focus back in on the right things. So, um, but those KPIs can be a little bit different for everyone, overly simplified version of what I'd look at, but Alex, anything else you want to add, uh, please feel free. No, I nailed it. That's perfect. And it's great insight. And I hope people actually leverage it. I mean, that's the biggest key, you know, that's what it really comes down to. As we wrap up the show, wanna, go ahead. You guys down, can we just give them i I'm not going to give away the whole KPI dashboard, at least just show them what that thing is right there. So they can see the math. It's really simple. You guys yeah, are open to that. Yeah, cool. feel free. Cool. So um, we're not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but if you're wondering, like, what is churn rate? How do I calculate churn rate? Basically, it's how many clients left in a month, right? And for you guys to have a healthy expectation of this, what we like to coach is an average churn rate, even if you're doing everything right and everything really, really well, it's about 15%. So um, if you have, let's make it really simple, 100 clients. 15, let's 15 in a month will roughly churn. So if you have 50, seven will churn, right? That's roughly what the math is. And frankly too, like it can feel as you get, as I'm killing a little bit of time finding this, um, as you get into your business, the more clients you get, even if you maintain a healthy churn rate that still feels good, it can still feel like you're losing a, a lot of clients just because the law of averages is now it's 15% of 20 or 15% of 30 or 50. Of course, we want to strive to have better but it shouldn't be at the cost of your scalability to help people. So right. let me show you guys um, it's agency performance growth. Just one quick second on the spreadsheet. Um, where basically you plug in here, you know, how many clients did you start the month with? How many did you end the month with? New clients you got and then clients who canceled, right? And just that alone, um, ideally also your revenue will give you a really good sense of, hey, what is my churn rate? What's my revenue at? What's my profit at? What's my average client value? That alone can make a big difference in helping you understand how, not only how you maintain what, like, what the business is, but how do I grow? You know how many clients you're churning per month. You know how many you need to acquire to uh, actually hit your, hit your revenue goals. So hopefully that little uh, snippet helped out a little bit. And uh, let's take it away to the last one. You're muted, Alex. I said, great insight, B. Thank you for sharing that. And let's wrap it up. Number five is build your list. Now, this is like one of the most uh, important practices in a business. And yet it's very seldom done. I mean, pretty crazy to be frank, but it's very, very seldom done. I think it's just the concept of wanting immediate gratification and the ability to get results right away. And so there's not enough effort and time and work put into developing a list, right? And so that's what we do, obviously, at POD. We develop a list. You know, we we nurture them. We send emails about what we do and share case, case studies and proof. And then we launch offers. Like we launch a Black Friday offer and get 55 people to buy it. We launch this podcast and get people to show up every week. We tell people when we have time, uh, space for coaching and we offer them the opportunity to jump on a call with us. Like leveraging and building your list is key. It's an important reminder to consider that you are not going to close every single person that you speak to. It's just not going to happen. Right. But the follow is really important. So at the minimum, you should be doing at least one one email per week and making sure that you have some ability of opt-in strategy to be able to get clients to come in. 
One of the most common ways people build lists is through a lead magnet that you provide some sort of free value to your niche. They opt in for it by giving you their email or phone number and name, and then you are able to follow up with them and leverage that, right? Now, there's a whole funnel strategy that we're not necessarily going to dive into today, but just the general sense of developing and building your list is important, right? There is value to it. And it's one of those situations of the tree, right? Brian likes bringing this up. When was the best time to plant the tree? Yesterday. When's the best time now? It's now. It's the same well, concept. No, it was the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Whatever, Second Brian, don't time. ruin it for me. Second best oh. time is right now. It's, it's best time to build a list was five to... years ago, but now's the second best time, right? And that's the thing. I'm... Everyone will always regret not building a list faster. One of the key things and KPIs that we track on a yearly basis is how many people are added to our Facebook group, which is inherently a list, and how many people are added to our email list. And I think this year we added like 7,500 people uh, to our email list, which is very good because some percentage of that 7,500 people are going to be uh, POD event attendees, POD clients at some point, um, uh, yeah. uh, what's it called, the show, show attendees, um, sponsors for our events, and any other numerous thing that could potentially happen. And those things are really, really important. And if you don't have that list, it's hard. So just really recommend developing and building your list uh, in 2024. So yeah, that was- I'm really gonna pile on one final thing here. Didn't expect to be, um, not passionate is the right word, but excitable about this, this one piece of advice around building the list, because I want you to understand, when I first started, I heard this idea of go build your list. I did it the wrong way. I did it by trying to develop, let's call it top of the funnel content, meaning I tried to go really wide and attract subscribers to my email list who are interested in my content, not people who are interested in my service. So again, I want you, all of you who are at that place where I need more clients right now, I need more income, I want to get my first clients, like, don't worry about building a list of subscribers, I want you to build a list of potential buyers. How do you do that? You do have a healthy balance of outbound prospecting. So anyone who shows interest but never ultimately closes, you can ask them, hey, is it okay if I put you on my list to circle back with you? Now you can grow your list that way. Number two, and most ideal, run paid ads, right? Not everyone who comes through your paid ads or books a sale, or is going to book a sales call right away. They may not be ready to buy right away, but that is a really effective way to build a list of buyers with intent not necessarily just of subscribers. So I did that the wrong way and they were interested in my, my cool content, not necessarily my products, my offers. So start at the bottom of the funnel with their offers to build your first list, get cash flow, and then it can be a longer term play like we're kind of discussing here. I'm sorry to put you on the spot with the metaphor, but if you're gonna co-op my co-opted <laughs> quotes, I gotta get, get them right. All good. <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Hope you enjoyed this. We do this show every single Thursday at 3.15 p.m. Eastern. We are always here for you. And we have them all replayed in the replay vault on prospectingondemand.com. If you want the replay vault, just drop a seven in the chat or a seven uh, in the actual Facebook group. And we'll have our appointment setter send it over to you. Uh, and then they'll ask you questions about how you want to run your business. And then we'll corner you and force you to pay us money uh, or shake you violently <laughs> until you do. That's how we act. I'm just kidding. I'm very tall. I'll pick you up like I did Jose from his ankle. Yep. We will actually just, just send Ryan you to your house and force you to pay. That's how it works. You're welcome. I'm kidding. I'm all kidding. All love. kidding. Hope you all have an amazing holiday season um, to you and yours. Uh, if you don't have someone to celebrate with um, this holidays, uh, we hope that uh, you know that you're loved and appreciated by us. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you on the next one. Adios.